What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This episode number 596. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources and joining me on the line all the way from Denver, Colorado. It's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, man, kind of a tough day today. How are you? How are you holding up? How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. But yeah, yeah, we just got a, a bit of a bombshell announcement when it comes to magic organized play, which is actually one of the things we're going to chat about a bit on the show today because, you know, it affects both of us in, in mm-hmm. both professional and personal capacities. But yeah, not not the most fun news to to kind of wake up to, as it were. Yeah, Luis and I are both pretty good at at handling news, I think, uh, for the, you know, bad news for the most part, but it still affects us for sure. And, and, uh, we're going to be getting into that. We're also going to talk about the arena open, uh, from the last weekend, as well as, oh, some potential futures for higher level limited play as they re- relate to not only the announcement we mentioned, but also the arena open, that kind of stuff. And then we'll also be diving into Strixhaven sealed. Um, in kind of broad strokes, uh, a little deeper because, uh, yeah, it's kind of standing out as a particularly interesting sealed format. So before we get into, uh, all of those topics, I've got to mention our sponsor, channelfireball.com. Really, uh, you know, times like these, uh, when you, when you receive news, which again, we'll be recapping in a minute, but you know, this was not good news on the, uh, on the professional magic front or the professional magic commentator front that we received today. And it's, uh, you know, the support of places like Channel Fireball and our listeners through Patreon as well, which I'll mention in a minute that, uh, you know, you really look at those and, and feel grateful, um, you know, that these relationships have been able to be built over the years and, uh, that we can keep doing shows like this and the things that we, we love to do. So thank you to CFB and thank you to everybody on the Patreon. Uh, just extra special thanks today, just because it really kind of uh, stands out on days like today. Um, if you need magical items, you can get them from channelfireball.com. They, they still have singles now, right, Luis? Oh yeah. You, you can, you can head on over to channelfireball.com, pick up all the singles you need from strict save the mixed mystical archive or going back much further than that. Mm-hmm. So anything you need there. And then of course there's CFB pro. If you want to uh, dive into the, well, the stuff that we like to do on the show here, the deeper strategic elements of the game, um, <clears throat> deck list, deck primers, uh, limited deep dives, that type of stuff to help get you prepared for if you're going to be playing in a tournament or if you just want to up your game. And, you know, we've always stood by the relatively obvious stance that magic is even more fun if you're winning. And, uh, you know, that's the, the core mission of this show is to help you win more, understand more, focus on the right things. And, uh, CFB pro provides even more tools from some of the best players in the world to help you do that. If you do sign up for CFB pro, pick up some, uh, some singles or some sealed product or some supplies, anything over at Channel Fireball. If you'd use the affiliate code LR, I'd really appreciate it. It helps out the show and it means a lot. Um, and I mentioned it a second ago, but the Patreon, really the lifeblood of the show, patreon.com slash limited resources. This is, you know, where people that listen to or watch or enjoy content can support the content creators that make it directly. And, uh, again, times like these, I, yeah, thank God for, for things like the Patreon and, for CFB because, uh, yeah, we got some pretty, pretty rough news, uh, as far as the, uh, commentator part of my <laughs> career went today. Um, and, uh, I want to say thank you to everybody <clears throat> on the Patreon who supports us. Uh, it means more than you probably could understand. Um, it's, it's life changing, uh, on our end. And so we really do appreciate it. If you're interested in checking it out, it's patreon.com slash limited resources. You get a signed thank you card in the mail, as well as a sticker uh, for whatever level you sign up for. And then there's some cool bonuses that you can get as you kind of work your way up the different levels. And uh, once again, we do appreciate it. Uh, one of the cool things you get too is, uh, it's really the most simple thing is you get access to the Patreon feed. So that's where we can put up posts, questions, stuff like that for, for our patrons. And it's also where we can solicit questions from you. And one of the places that we, or one of the things we do for that is the Patreon question of the week. This one comes from Neil who says, Hey, I'm a returning player and I've been struggling with draft since returning. What are the biggest changes in the last five years to draft and how should I be adjusting? I feel like I value removal too highly and don't value the one drops enough in modern magic. Yeah. He's kind of onto something there. 
those are both definite changes to draft one drops. I remember we did a, one of the first episodes I did. I, I, I have to imagine it was within like the first 10 episodes or something. Mm-hmm. I, though my memory is hazy at this point was uh, the biggest traps in magic. Mm, and yeah, oh yeah. one of them was, was playing <laughs> bad one drops, but the one drops are all just like kind of great right now. I guess star pupil. I have not been impressed with, mm-hmm. but almost all the one drops in these recent sets actually pack enough punch to make it worth playing your unwilling ingredients and whatnot. And I think that's really cool. I, I, I prefer it when one drops are playable because, because why have the one mana cards not be good? You know, it's kind of cool when they are good. You're just bare sentinels of, of the world. So definitely one drops have gone up in value and that's a good thing to identify. Neil removal has gone down in value. I guess, I guess one difference is you don't really run out of things to do in Modern Limited. It feels like most sets have mechanics, whether that's like learner lesson or or cycling or or what have you, that give you all this gas. Double-faced cards definitely did that. You got to play yep. more lands but also have more spells. So you, I do think you you can prioritize card advantage mechanisms a little lower than you used to. You know, and obviously sometimes you, you have some really good ones still. It's not like Soros Pac-Mate is a bad card and Behold the Multiverse performed pretty well too. Mm-hmm. But in general, like you don't need to to try to figure out like what is my deck going to do in the late game? How do I not run out of gas? Because just kind of naturally these cards give you so much extra stuff to do that focusing on getting on the board early and having, you know, good early plays is really important. Like. I, I would describe Strixhaven not as a very aggressive set, but a set where you do have to be doing things fairly early so that you can make use of having all those extra cards. Like the fact that half your cards draw you a card isn't going to help you if you don't have ways to to get on the board and at the very least defend yourself if not attack the opponent. Yeah, it, it, that's a really – that that is something that is hard to tell on an individual card level but that when you play the sets, you recognize I'm never running out of stuff to do. I just always have stuff to do. And, you know, I think a good way to frame it would be uh, older limited, say, go back six, seven years was more more about individual card power. So what did the card do? Because and, and then most of the cards just did the thing that it said. And that was it. There's no, uh, you know, not as many sets had uh, these or good early, good late, or you can pay extra type mechanics that we see so much now, or mana sinks weren't as common as they are now. And then, so what would happen is you would play some number of those and you'd need to kill your opponent's versions of those. So you would take removal and, you know, going back even further, the removal was so good because it was so efficient and cheap and relatively unconditional. But even five years ago, the removal was already uh, much slower, had been slowed down a lot. So then you're thinking in terms of, okay, I play a bunch of things that are individually good and that they do what they do. My opponent plays a bunch of removal or ways to negate the things that I do. So the way that I break this stall is I have more things to do. So I would prioritize things that would draw me a bunch of cards and then I could play more individual things that could win. That isn't really how it plays out. Now the cards are almost every set now has something that's flexible, like what Luis was talking about with something with kicker or flashback or morph, or the double face cards, or cards that give you two different options to cast it at the time of casting or later, you know, aftermath, all of these things happen over and over and over again that we see this. And it really does lead to games where you just feel like you have infinite to do. With regards to the one drops, there was a point I don't, I've never gotten confirmation from anybody at Wizards that this was like actually made a, you know, a directive but it's pretty obvious that they said, we really need to make sh- – like these one drops are just throwaways. Why are we printing them? Let's make them relevant. And now they are. And so the way I used to look at one drops was I would almost always skew towards this probably isn't going to be good enough. And I was almost always right, you know, above 90% right. Now when I see them, I skew the other way. And I say, even though it doesn't really look that great – they just aren't putting in throwaway one drops at the clip that they used to. So I'm going to assume that this actually has a home until proven other, otherwise. And you'll be right. I'd say the majority of the time there, maybe not 90%. So that's a good way to look at that. Um, I will also add that mana sinks that aren't particularly great have gone down in value as well because you often just have better things to do. What's the thing called? Worm, worm sinkhole serpent? Yeah, thing? wormhole serpent. Yeah, right? Cards like that 
before would be like, hey, this is a mana sink that can win you the game. Now, when you have that card on the battlefield, it's very rare that you don't say, I just could just do something better than that right now. You know, unless it's winning you the game that turn. Look at Zumon, right? In draft, Mm -hmm. Zumon, the one, two that you can pay four tap, draw a card, or or draw two if you have eight lands. I, I, my, my evaluation of her has gone down a, a lot because you play her on turn two. Most games you have better things to do than activate her on turn four mm. and turn five. And like, yes, on sometimes in the late game, it's like a two mana card they have to kill, and that part's great. So I'm not saying you should not play the card, but honestly, like a Quandrix Pledge Mage is just going to perform better for you in almost every situation. You, you just don't have the time spending four mana to draw a card. Like I've, and, and that actually kind of changed how I played as well because. It used to be like, oh, got to kill that thing. But then I was like, you know, I don't put this card in my deck as often anymore for a reason. I'm going to try not killing it when they play it. And if they want to spend turn four using this, like I think I'm actually just going to make enough board presence that they're going to lose. And most of, multiple times my opponents have just not used it on turn four because I'm like, hey, I never used it on turn four. Maybe they're just not going to use it on turn <laughs> yeah. four. Yeah. And then when they do use it on turn four, sometimes it's like, oh, that doesn't actually matter. Like, that's not actually good. Yeah. You're kind of like, congratulations. Enjoy your card. You know, take all this or I'm going to add way more to the battlefield. Yeah. So good question. Um, and, and we do appreciate that, uh, Neil. Really good stuff. And definitely something for people that have come back to the game. It is much different now than it was five years ago and way, 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 way different than it was, say, eight-ish years ago or so. So, uh, so yeah, good stuff. Uh, let's crack a pack here, Luis, and get into Strixhaven. Um, our first card out is our lesson, and it is Expanded Anatomy. That's the three mana sorcery lesson. Put two plus one plus one counters on your creature, gain vigilance. This is one we had a discussion about last week on the show as well. Uh, definitely performs better than thought, but I also brought up the kind of counterpoint that, well, that's because you can pick the times when it's good, you know, to get it. But, Boy, I'll tell you, Luis, I want one of these in my board. It, it, I really thought it was a throwaway lesson, just like I would never actually play it. And that is not the case. I, I do want one of these around. Oh, yeah. I'm always looking for an expanded anatomy. It's a must in like your aggressive white decks. You just the, the decks. I'm not going to say they don't function, but they're significantly weaker without access to an, uh, an expanded anatomy. But even in my Prismari or Quandrix decks that aren't particularly aggressive, I still really want one. Sometimes you just have the opportunity to play your lesson card, put this on like a 4-4 four, four or a 5-5, five, five, and they just either like force a chump or just crack in for a bunch of damage and then have a good blocker. Mm-hmm. Card's great. I, I don't really want to first pick it, but I will if I have to. Yeah, I'm not first picking it, uh, especially not here, because I've got a moldering Karak here for you, Luis. Two I black green, three, three, <laughs> trample, lifelink. Have you played this much? I mean, I've played it uh, enough times to realize you shouldn't play the card mostly. <laughs> <laughs> like it's just too much smaller than everything else and it doesn't build towards anything. Like, yes, yeah. yeah, sometimes you really need life gain. You know, you've got a bunch of blood researchers, but this, you know, like you look at blood researcher or Quantrix pledge mage, these build into things, right? They get bigger and, and have huge, you know, are huge threats on the board. Or you look at something like Witherbloom pledge mage which really justifies its inclusion by how strong it is on the board and how much it does for you. You look at a, you know, a card like Mulder and Karak, it's just going to lose to three drops and doesn't really accomplish much for you. Yeah, you know, I had a really interesting um, thing pop up. So Woody, you know, my buddy Woody, he was uh, looking to practice some sealed for the Arena Open. And so he, him and I looked at a few pools on Arena together and I was trying to help him build. But he's been kind of busy and hasn't been playing much Strixhaven. So he's kind of... You know, he knows some of the cards and stuff. And he's played a few drafts, but he hasn't really dove in and really like kind of gotten up to speed on where we're at with the format. And it was really interesting because he kept putting cards into his deck or maybe even splashing them where I was like, no, no, no you don't want to be doing that. And it was interesting because he's like, well, why not? Like this card looks really good, right? Like you're going to have a hard time arguing that this card isn't just a solid, good magic card or whatever. And I had to actually really think about it because the type of cards he was putting in were like Quintorius, right? Which again, it looks like a really solid magic card, right? It's like, dude, you only need to make one, you know, effectively a four, two, if you have it out before you feel good. And there's combo potentials where you can spit out a bunch of spirits. You know, you'd think that would be a card worth splashing or, or being interested in. Um, What's the four and a green three, three that when you magecraft, it puts a counter on a creature? Karak Wrangler, actually. <laughs> right. Karak Wrangler. 
Right. And like, you know, he, he wanted, he was, I was like, you don't want that card. Right. And he's like, I don't get it. Like I have all these spells, like this thing looks like it would be sweet. And it's like, boy, you really do have to kind of challenge yourself because those cards on paper are totally fine cards, but they just don't perform in the format. Is the format really fast? No, it's not really that either. It's not like you're going to get ran over that often, but it goes back to what you said, Luis, you have to be doing relevant things basically at all stages. And that's why, you know, interestingly enough, in many decks, I'd rather have the five, five, right? The Witherbloom pledge mage over the five mana, three, three with all this upside, give it to me now, or give me something now and something later. You know, I, I want to be lesson learning over cards that don't have that, you know? And so, Moldering and Karak is another good example of that. It's a fine creature with good stats. It doesn't keep up with the format. Um, Heated Debate is our next card. Love this card. Two and a green, or excuse me, two and a red instant. Can't be countered. And yes, it counts Ward, and it does four damage to a creature, Planeswalker. Yeah, very solid card. Obviously, just a fantastic removal spell. It, yep. it, it, it hasn't overperformed, but it hasn't underperformed either. Just gives you exactly what you're looking for. Just three mana to kill anything you want, just about. And uh, getting around Ward is nice. It's the best answer to Owl and Shield Mage in the format. Yep. Um, Prismari Pledge Mage is the two mana, either red or blue in any combo. It's 3-3 three, three with Defender. And with Magecraft, it gets not Defender anymore. I like this card a lot, too. This is the type of card that I can actually play on turn two that allows me to buy some time to set up my very expensive uh, Prismari cards, which I will take and play about as many as I can get of. Yeah, and sometimes you have the games where you play a Prismari Pledge Mage into a like, heated debate their creature, and then next turn maybe you cast a pop quiz, and then all of a sudden it's dealt six or nine damage, which is pretty good for a card that you're fairly happy with as a defensive body. Yeah, uh, professor's warning. This is black for an instant. Choose one, put a plus one, plus one counter on a creature or it gets indestructible until end of turn. Definitely playable. The aggressive silver quill decks, especially ones that have some good magecraft going on, are pretty happy with the card. I also don't mind it in Witherbloom when I've got multiple blood researchers and Witherbloom pledge mages or Witherbloom apprentice because when, when you put a high value creature out, a one mana card that can protect it and trigger magecraft at the same time, is pretty nice, but clearly, like this is the card of card I still try to take on the wheel. I, I really am unhappy to take this card in the first couple picks. Uh, field trip to an agreed source researcher library for a basic forest, put on the battlefield, tapped and then learn. I really like field trip. Yeah, it has impressed me because putting a card, a, a forest under the battlefield, even tapped does accelerate you into a good play by a turn. It's got the natural curve into elemental summoning in Quandrix. You just make a 4-4 four, four on turn 4. And it's 2-for-1. It's it's a 2-for-1 that doesn't... Like, it doesn't put a creature on the board, but it does accelerate you into your bigger plays or into a turn where you can make two plays. I think a common line for me is, like, field trip into next turn place, play a creature plus something else, like a 2-drop plus a 3-drop. Mm -hmm. And as a result, uh, I, I find field trip to be a fairly high pick thought you were going to say a common line for you is to play field trip and then a couple of turns later play <laughs> mascot exhibition oh, no, no, and we're then gonna play cover another one of those <laughs> uh, teach by example this is the blue red blue red hybrid two mana instant whenever you cast or when you cast your next instant or sorcery copy it you can choose new targets for the copy seeing more play um yeah, than i anticipated still wouldn't call it great no it's it's the kind of card that tends to make good decks better because to make this card good, you want a lot of like heated debates and Ignis inspirations and stuff like that. So you kind of have to already have the goods, but it it can make those decks into nice ones. I mean, this plus Mage Duel is a kind of a nice little combo too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it it I, I'm surprised that it sees any play, but uh, whenever it does it, it does things. Uh, Rise of Extus. This is the four white white or four black black or four black white sorcery exile a creature. And then, and also exile an instant or sorcery card from a graveyard, which ends up being really important just because it gives it a, a target so that it can still resolve even if the creature is not there. Uh, and then occasionally you'll nab something that, that actually matters too. But then critically here, you get to learn. I mean, this is a, this is a very, very, very powerful six drop that if you can get to this point, you take out their key threat and you go get your next key threat or even another answer. And it ends up being really powerful. I, I have been very, very impressed with Rise. My main hesitance to first picking it uh, is that it's a six-mana spell, and mm -hmm. you just don't have room for tons of them. But I think that – I actually do think I would take Rise over Heated Debate 
pick one, pack one, because I wow. think it is that much stronger. But I think the two cards are close. I guess right now I am on Rise of Exodus. It also fits into Silver Blue, Silver Quill or Wither Bloom pretty nicely. It, it can also fit into uh, Lorehold, but I, I, I don't love really starting there. I still draft Lorehold at a lower rate than any other decks, but in all three of those decks, it's going to be one of your better cards. Yeah, I, I was still a heated debate myself, but uh, but Rise is the, my second pick. Um, Resculpt, one on a blue instant exile target artifact or creature. Its controller creates a 4-4 uh, four, four element. I've never said this card be good. Yeah, terrible. Um, Lorehold Campus. So this is uh, these campuses are great, but I, I wouldn't. Uh, consider the Lorehold campus here. Next is uh, Practical Research. This is the three blue red instant draw four cards and discard two cards unless you discard an instant or sorcery card. So this is the kind of card I I think going back to the the Patreon question of the week that mm-hmm. I don't think you should value quite as highly as you as you used to. Mm-hmm. It used to be that cards like Tidings or Opportunity, the like draw draw fours for a lot of mana, were, were very strong. And this hits a spot where it's expensive enough that I don't think you have time to to play this that often. That's not to say I'm not going to put the card in my deck. I, I basically always play it when I'm Prismari. But I would rather have a card like Compulsive Research, a three mana card, or Pop Quiz even, or a card like Blue Sun Zenith or the Mastery that lets you uh, lets you just pay two blue and X and draw X cards. Practical Research falls in this bucket where it's expensive enough that you have to take a critical turn off, a five mana turn off. But it also doesn't crush them like these are the really expensive spells. So I have this at lower than both Heated Debate and Rise of Exodus, which I wouldn't have coming in. In fact, I think I have it lower than Field Trip, too. I think I'd rather have all those cards. Wow. Do you, do you remember the scene on The Godfather where he grabs Fredo and he says, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's happening right now. Like, I mean, I know would you take practical you. research here? I, I know it was you, Luis. <laughs> you <laughs> broke my heart. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I love practical research. And my decks make oh. so much mana <laughs> that like I can double spell off of a practical research turn. That's who I am. I'd all probably, right, all right. I'd probably take you to debate. Um, okay, good. I, I was, I was, yeah. but I do like I practical research. Um, honor troll. Speaking of <laughs> Luis, uh, two and a, two and a green, two, three vigilant. Uh, if you would gain life, you gain that much life plus one instead, and it gets plus two plus one if you have 25 or more life. Another perfect example of a card that stands on its own as decent stats and, and has a nice little bonus and is just not ever where I want to be in the format. Uh, not just because of like life gain or, or where it fits or anything. It's because I need, I need cards that two for one or, you know, are more flexible or set up my later game or do more. This is like an old school card design. This is the type of thing that would have been good 10 years ago because it's a threat that you need to kill at some point and, and it can, you know, outstat itself. But now I'm like, I don't need, I just ignore this card. If my opponent plays it, I'm like, Oh, thank God. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, it is not good. It just, yeah. it just, it just doesn't do enough. No. So, I'm off honor troll here. And this is a good example too. Master Symmetrist is our next card. It's two green, green, four, four reach. And whenever a creature you control with power uh, equal to its toughness attacks, it gets trampled. And you might think, oh, that's kind of similar to honor troll, but it's not. It's weird. Master Symmetrist is actually a card I'm interested in uh, much more so than honor troll because it actually often does do a thing the turn you cast it. I know it doesn't seem like it, but you play this card and you send your 6-6 six, six fractal in and they're staring down at their stupid pests or whatever, and you actually got something out of this. And then the fact that it has reach really does count as well. It's a 4-4 four, four with reach, which means that it gobbles up uh, most of the flyers that you see. 3-3, three, 2-1 three, flyer, kind of the two most common. Uh, you know, basically, three-powered or the two-one flying inklings, and uh, the symmetrist gobbles up all of those. So, yeah, I like it better, you know, and it because it does just enough there. It's still, for me, not on the level of these other cards we've been talking about, like Heated Debate, Rise, and Practical Research, but um, but Symmetrist is a card I want in my deck. Yeah, I, w- I would say it's not too too far behind these other cards. Yeah. Like, the fact that it has reach, also secret reach, that you, you can count on this one to, to eat, a, eat, a, eat a Frost Trickster, <laughs> I would say, most of the days of the week, you know? <laughs> Like, like Monday through you know, Thursday, he's eating a like, frost. Like may, may, maybe a little less when you get up to like diamond or mythic, but like you, you play this card in like gold. Like oh man, it is it is devouring a frost. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> so, followed by the followed by the pause plus the nice. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, I like the symmetrist, but I, I I think I'm still on rise or heated debate. I, I don't know. Either one of those seems pretty good to me. Our rare is Auric Lore Mage. This is the two black black human warlock. It's a three three, and you can tap it to search your library for a card. Put it into your graveyard and then shuffle. And if it was an instant or sorcery, you put a counter on the lore mage. Has this ever done anything good either on your side or on the other side? No, I heard rumors of uh, one of Ben S's opponents combining this with Harness Infinity. The card lets you draw your graveyard. <laughs> oh, that's dope. <laughs> but I, uh, no, no, I, I have not, I have not found either. this card to be particularly no, strong. Me neither. It probably falls victim to the same type of stuff we've been talking about where it's just not enough – the ter- you know, it just doesn't do enough uh, when you play it. Our last card is our Mystical Archive card. It's called Tendrils of Agony. You may have heard of it, Luis. Two black, black, sorcery, target player loses two life. You gain two life and it has Storm. I did hear that some people have put together some sweet tendrils uh, wins or whatever, but uh, I've never been tendrils out and I've never tendrils anybody out in the format. It's not a card you should take, Carly. It's the kind of card where if you end up with a deck with a lot of mage craft, let's say like some Wither Bloom Apprentice action, enough cheap spells, you know, maybe some life gain payoffs, all of that comes together. It could barely get over the line, mm-hmm. but it's definitely not a card you should prioritize. Yeah, like how many how many instances of Tendrils of Agony would you need to have to put it in your deck? And like, let's say at the D plus C minus level where you're like, fine, it's in my deck. Is if you, it, if make- you drain for six, is that enough? I mean, if you can drain for six and are a deck that cares about draining for six, Mm -hmm. then yes, this card can be really strong. Like imagine you're an aggro sober cool deck with a lot of magecraft triggers. You care about their life total and you've got a lot of cheap spells. Even for four, this could be good if it's triggering like a silver quill apprentice and like an eager first year and you played it off a combat trick. But for the most part, like this card doesn't doesn't quite make the cut. Okay. Um, so for me, I would take heated debate here. Yeah, I, I would prefer rise, I think, but I don't know. That's really close. I, I, mm-hmm. I could see myself taking either kind of depending on what I was feeling, honestly. Yeah, that, that, that's probably what it would be for me. I, I, I've just really enjoyed teamer so much. I've been playing it really the majority of the time at this point. Um, so yeah, there you go. There's our crack pack. So let's start off with the bad news and then we'll end on a higher note. How about that, Luis? <laughs> Um, there was a, the beginnings of a major organized play announcement today, uh, from, from wizards. Um, do we want to try to recap it or what do we do? Well, I can, I can do this kind of efficiently. Uh, basically the current structure of organized play is that there's rivals in MPL, like there's the rivals league and the, and the magic pro league. And there's not much outside of that like if you're outside of that it means you're like a challenger who's going to try to make it into one of those leagues by (laughs) participating in a gauntlet tournament at the end of the year well they announced that the leagues will continue next year in 2022 but the leagues will there no there will be no gauntlets and there will be the leagues will end at the end of that year you're not getting into them anymore like at the end of 2022 those leagues are gone there's going to – like the current structure of Magic Organized Play as we know it will cease to exist. And then in 2023, there will be something, but we don't know what that is yet. And they kind of emphasized, they being wizards, that it will not be set up that being a professional Magic player will be a full-time career. Mm-hmm. Uh, in addition, you know, speaking to the part that affects like you and the commentary folks, it's unclear how many events will require broadcast commentary and – what is clear is there won't be very many, at right. least uh, as currently slated. We obviously like a lot of this is ambiguous. They they felt like they they needed to tell people this well in advance. Like we're talking fifteen months in advance when it comes to like the leagues, for example, mm-hmm. so, so that they can make decisions for their future. Which I, I understand that. The downside of that is they're not able to promise or really say anything about what's going to happen next. I don't think they know exactly what that looks like yet. I, right. They're definitely moving away from supporting the like top level of organized play, which, yeah, I mean, I think makes both of us sad, right? We're, it does. Like, I, I, I was, am, whatever, a, a pro magic player for a long time. 
you you are involved the highest levels at co- of covering those events. You know all the people involved. You know the whole system, and we, you know, we 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 kind of loved that, right? There was yeah. a lot that we we loved about it, um, and this is a is a big blow to that. The part that I keep coming back to is, I already felt this way when the MPL was formed three years ago, mm. when you know anyone not in the MPL, and I, I was not then. I mean, I'm not now. I wasn't then in the MPL there wasn't much of an avenue for organized play for any of us who weren't in that. Mm -hmm. So that part was already kind of gone. So this isn't a huge sea change from that. The the part that I find kind of funny about this is if I do well this weekend, I'll be in the MPL. (laughs) (laughs) But you know, that's going to be in the last MPL, I guess. Is that the question? Yeah. It's neither here nor there, but uh, yeah, I, I think that like it does, it is unfortunate that, so much of the thing we loved is going away, but I also think the current system is untenable. Like I mm-hmm. don't think the M- the MPL was not a success. It's not even what I think. It just wasn't a success. Wizards doesn't think it was a success. The people in it don't think it was a success. I don't think the public does either. And be given that, like, well, it had to go away for them to make something new. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's not like, yes, whatever comes next could be, could I guess could be worse, but it's, already a system that doesn't include almost anyone who wants to play. It's not a system that helps aspiring magic players. If you're someone who's at the PTQ level and you're interested in playing high level magic, you then you look at the MPL and rivals, you're like, Oh, never mind. I, I, this isn't for me. Whereas the old system, which we're not going to go back to, they've made that clear, but the old system did do that. And I, and I suspect, especially if they're going to take away like the top level or, or put less focus on the top level, the new system, I would hope, is accessible then for people who want to get into organized play and want to participate, and I hope it succeeds at those goals. Yeah, th- that's really the the thing that that's popped up here, right? Like, if you want to think about it from a fundamental viewpoint, they took a top down approach with the MPL and Rivals approach, right? They said, "What if we focus on the very top of our competitive scene? Try to develop stars there. Try to put." you know, the money towards the top as far as prize pools, production value, all that stuff at the very, very peak of limit of, uh, uh, professional play. And what they've said now is that they're going to reverse that. They're going to try a ground up approach, which my assumption, and you know, it's worth noting here that, uh, there is no information to be had here. Like wizards doesn't even know this stuff yet. This is still, uh, you know, way far out as far as being planned goes. So they've just given us these, You know, if you read the article, you can sort of get these broad strokes. But the way I interpret it is that they'd like to focus on ground level magic, meaning at the local game store, uh, maybe at regional size tournaments like GPs or something that approximate those. And they also had a big emphasis on the gathering. They had this sort of cheeky little, oh, we're, we're back in the gathering, right? But that does make sense, right? Because they are seemingly trying to get people sitting across from each other playing magic again after the pandemic is fully behind us. And to me, you know, this is a completely different approach and it's bittersweet. It really is. Um, On one hand, I have to look at this from a career perspective as well. And, you know, I mean, I, it's not completely gone, but I mean, I just had something that I've put, you know, eight or nine years of, building and effort, sacrifice and, and time into, um, you know, kind of go away. I mean, it's not completely gone and, but it's completely muddled as an adult. I can't, I can't look forward to the next year and a half to two years and think, well, this is just going to be part of my job. I have to pivot and do other stuff and then see where the dust settles. And if there's a place for me, then great. But you know, I, you know, they've made it very clear that that, there's nothing is guaranteed at this point, as far as coverage goes and, and pro play goes. And so on one hand, this is good, right? Like you said, MPL and rivals wasn't working and it needed to go away to, to start something new. Um, also like the people we're talking to right now, Luis, the vast majority of our audience, I think will have a better competitive play experience if they dump money, effort, marketing, et cetera, into the broader base of players. I mean, I've heard it since the MPL started from, you know, listeners of the show, friends of mine, um, not just pro players, but all the way down the line of people saying, well, I don't really get organized play anymore. Like I used to think, okay, well, you know, I can try to win a PTQ or I can go to a GP and try to do well at that and try to work my way up to the pro tour. You know, one example I love to use for this is my friend Woody. 
He's played in a couple of PTs. He top eighted a GP. He won a PTQ. And, you know, he, that was where he was going to be, right? He, he didn't actually have aspirations to be a pro player because he has a career in the games industry as a digital artist. And, you know, he went to school for that and he's put a lot of time and years developing his career. So he was never like, I'm just going to jump off of this and go become a magic player. But he liked the idea, you know, that he could grind, put in the time, beat people at the local level and make it up to, you know, getting to play against you. Right. And even if he knew that that wasn't going to be where he ended, you know, that was a worthy goal for him. Well, since the MPL, he's just like, he does metal detecting now. Like he doesn't, he yeah. <laughs> plays a little bit of magic, but he's not really interested because he's like, I don't get it. Like I, can I, can I go and play against Luis at the, at the highest levels? And it's kind of like, I can't really explain it to you. And you definitely can't get to the highest levels. Like no way. Like I would never, ever, ever tell anybody, even a good player like Woody, that they should try to get into rivals. Like no way. Don't even think about it. Like it's such a waste. The chances that you get in are so small where if you came up to me and you're like, I'm a pretty good player. I do well on arena and magic online. And I'm interested in, in exploring high level play in the old system. I would say, Hey, you should try to qualify for the PT. Like it's a great experience. It, you know, it's a really fun thing to get to do. It's cool just to be able to say, I got to play against, you know, the, the best players in the world. And that's a worthy goal to me. Something that if you have the time and expendable income and the desire that you should, you should approach, you know, you should go for that. So, you know, hopefully by the time everything's wound back up again, we do see more of that. And that's speaking to you, our listener, right? That maybe a bunch of you will have a better path to experience high level competitive play because most people aren't trying to be a full-time professional magic player. That's just not the, the goal for, for the vast majority of even competitive players. So that part's good. The, de- the bad part's really sad. I'm really bummed about it today. Um, I remember when I first became aware of pro magic and it was like, I kind of felt like I found home and it's not just the, the game and the, and that stuff, but the, the players and stuff, it's just, they're their own breed. You know, it's magic players. They communicate differently. And I'm talking about pro players. They communicate differently. They act differently. They value things differently than the vast majority of people that you'll meet. And I prefer them. I like that style. Um, you know, one of the things that really stands out if you're in a room full of professional magic players is that intelligence is valued. In fact, it's it's respected. It's vaunted. There's a lot of places, I would say most places here in the States that you go, that people shun you if you're smart. Oh, Mr. Smarty Pants. Oh, look at this guy with the big words. Oh, look at, you know, that kind of stuff that you hear where, oh, this fancy guy went to this big college and, you know, he's a computer programmer. And, you know, and it's like <laughs> you get that stuff. And here it's like you have to be a computer programmer to walk into the room with a room full of professional magic players, you know, and it, it feels really good to, to be around people who celebrate critical thinking and intelligence and reward it and say, I respect you because you do that. And we can have a conversation where we both approach things in a similar way and don't have to explain it to each other about, well, that's not really how that works, you know, that kind of thing. And then there was, the emotional component of pro tour Sundays, the the buzz in the room on Friday before the first draft, the excitement of meeting people that had qualified for their first PT and, and getting to say hi and kind of seeing the, the, the joy on their face, the feeling I had in my stomach and my heart when I was sitting, you know, particularly like before a top eight match to do coverage alongside you or alongside Paul. And, you know, I want my, my whole goal, my whole vibe, for this whole thing, the thing that I love doing about coverage and that I still do is I feel like I found something really special with professional high level magic. It's, it is so complicated and so awesome, so deep. It requires so much dedication. There's so many layers to it that are just not obvious to even a magic player, even somebody who knows the rules of magic. And I always viewed it as my, job and and the thing that I wanted to do was to open that up and show that to as many people as I possibly could about why this was exciting and interesting and fascinating and all the things that I thought about it. And now not only am I going to have, you know, drastically fewer option uh, opportunities to do that, but also I don't even know what high level magic would look like now. 
under the system that I described from in broad strokes of it's ground up, what that would mean in my mind, and Luis, tell me if if, if you feel this, if, if this makes sense to you, is instead of having an incentive structure that says, if you do well, you will get to come back. And then if you do well, you'll get to build up, build up until you get to the point that you are now at a level where you are going to be paid on some, some amount to be a pro player. Instead, I think it'll just be a bunch of standalone tournaments. Maybe you can leapfrog from one to the next. It's like, hey, if you top eight this, you can play in the next one. But there will be no big carrot at the end to incentivize people to long-term keep committing. It's just kind of you keep popping up here and there, but there's no big, big structure there. If that's the case, well, I think we're still going to have good magic players. But I think the definition of the best players in the world would change pretty drastically without that incentive. That makes me sad. Yeah. I, I I mean, I think I feel a lot of the same way about you that, that you do where I, I really liked that for a long time and for a a, a good amount of people, like what their goal was, was to just try to be the best magic player. And I thought that was really cool. Like, it was just really cool that they got to chase that and they got to pursue that. And that Watsi kind of decided that it was in their own interest to subsidize that, (laughs) you know, because I think that you're still going to see a lot of magic pros, like pro pro magic of some form where it's not going to be the same. Of course, we don't even know what it's going to look like, but there's going to be people who are good at magic and care about how they do at magic tournaments and will go to magic tournaments with the, you know, goal of winning them and, and we'll try to reap the rewards of that. But what you're going to see is a lot of kind of how well, a lot of us have already structured our lives where we do content, we do podcasts, we do streaming. I always thought this was a component that you needed to have. Like, did, did you ever remember a time when I wasn't doing these things? No, and, God, no. And, and not only just doing them, but like doing them. I mean, you, yeah. you, you've, you, your output has been absolutely absurd since I've met you. I mean, you just – you know, constantly making stuff. And the reason for that is that I never viewed pro magic as something like the, it, the, that stood alone uh, for a number of reasons. One is stability. I cared. Well, I cared about where I kind of got my paychecks coming from and I decided even before going into it, it wasn't acceptable to me to have those just be like, Hey, I hope I do well enough in this tournament. <laughs> mm-hmm. The other is that it wasn't enough for me, like in terms of occupying my mind to, to just do pro magic. I wanted to, I wanted to, to learn other things and learning how to do draft videos and learning how to eventually like podcast and all these things. Like I care about that stuff and I like it. I really enjoy it. I'm passionate about it. Obviously like, you know, I'm, I'm not here every week because of the paycheck, um, to speak of which now <laughs> I'm going to need some outside sources of income. No, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I, I did like that. Some people did exist who did that who only played magic and all their, their goals to be the best at magic. And I feel very fortunate in that I was able to achieve magic success without just going completely all in on it. But some part of me wonders like, what if I just didn't do anything else and I just was all in on it? Like Mm -hmm. what would have happened then, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's not really a reasonable thing to like hang your hat on exactly. But like some people did do that. And I thought that was really cool. It's kind of, you know, you know, the, when we were talking before the show, the example I gave you was like, it's kind of like how patrons of the arts used to like pay artists just to create art. Mm-hmm. Not not really because they thought it was financially sound to do that. And look, I don't think it's Watsi's responsibility to do this or that they're beholden to do this. And I don't want to like compare exactly like playing magic to being an artist. But like there's some elements of the same. I just thought there was something pure about it. Like yep. you're not doing this for the paycheck. Trust me. Pro magic just doesn't doesn't pay like – the amount of money that you would need give based on the input you put into it, like how much dedication you have. Like you have to be one of the like top 20 best magic players in the entire world to like make a living doing this. Right. And we're not talking about, no one's getting rich off this, right. but we all did it because we loved it. And I thought that part was really cool. And that part, you know, maybe being lessened is, is unfortunate, but I also think that, you know, this makes sense. I, I understand why this makes sense for Watsi. Like it's their job. Their job is not to figure out who the best magic player is. It kind of never was. And mm-hmm. I think it's totally fine if what they're going to transition to is trying to provide more opportunities to more people. Because look, they tried the MPL thing. It didn't work. It it wasn't serving the people. Like I, I've said this so many times on stream that it wasn't aspirational. Nobody thought they could be in the MPL because nobody could be in the MPL. In fact, 
Nobody got into the MPL. Like they, they had right. a turnover of four people in the first year or something. Right. And I don't know. I loved it when my friends who I, you know, grew up playing magic with, played magic with in college would like message me about PTQ decks, which they stopped doing when the MPL started because there wasn't no point in doing it. There wasn't anything to play in, you know? And I think that uh, if we're going to a world where maybe that, that kind of starts again, like, yeah, that would be awesome. I, I, I think yeah. that there's going to be some upside here and, that's not without sympathy for the folks who do play pro magic and now find a, kind of find themselves out of a job. But I don't know. This is the way the cookie crumbles. And yeah. I'm not thrilled about the losses, but I think that there is potentially a light at the end of the tunnel and we'll kind of have to see what that is. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I, I don't feel any anger. Um, I do feel sad. I do feel concerned also. I mean, this is just a a career hit for me. I have to kind of pivot. You know, I don't know if I need to start pumping out a lot more watch videos or what's what I need to do. But you know, that's a, that's a thing that, you know, affects me on some level that I have to kind of figure out what I'm going to do with that. But you know, when it comes to this stuff, I mainly just feel kind of bummed. It just, I knew it was a special thing. I just, I damn it. The first time that I went and covered a PT, I'm like, this is, this is the thing that people need to know about. It's just, it's, it's not huge, right? This isn't, soccer or something where it's like we need stadiums and stadiums of people but for the people that this appeals to this is special and i do feel like we may be uh you know saying goodbye to that here at least it has that emotional feel but there's so much more to know one thing i wanted to ask you about luis was you said that it didn't work right you said well you know mpl as an esport or whatever didn't work what's your take on why it, do, do you think that it's just simply not suited for bigger audiences or for whatever? Or do you think that, that, that Wizards has some blame here for decisions that they made, the way that it was implemented, that kind of stuff? I think that we we don't have time on the podcast to talk about the amount of mistakes that the MPL uh, organization made. <laughs> okay, well, that answers that question. <laughs> if, that, if, if you want to know the answer. Uh, it was not – look, I don't know if the MPL could have succeeded. I am frustrated we won't find out that world we don't get to see any alternate timelines because the way it was implemented was extremely poor in a lot of ways i mean you were involved in the in the broadcasts of the first mpl weekly and like mm -hmm. yeah we're, we're going to show you pre-recorded highlights of pre-recorded matches of, of old formats from a week ago mm -hmm. like yeah even they, as recently as the as the strixhaven league weekend which strixhaven was not legal yet yeah. like you, you're just not setting this up to succeed you know and that's a shame I can't say that I know everything that goes into all the decisions or all the constraints they're working with. It's it's more complicated than most people think. I, I do understand that. But I also know that like, yeah, you know, Magic was trying to be an eSport. Maybe that wasn't where Magic's core strength is. I don't think it is. You know, I think that there's so much to love about Magic. I still maintain it's the best game ever. But is it the best viewing experience ever? I don't know. I think the one of the best ways to sum it up is – the MPO was trying to focus on making on optimizing for tournaments that are fun to watch instead of tournaments that are fun to plan. And then it turned out they also weren't even that fun to watch. Yeah. And at the end of the day, like they didn't, they really didn't get buy in from the pros, like, and the pros have some amount of responsibility here. They could have done, I think a better job of cooperating with wizards or promoting the thing. But that at the end of the day, I don't, it doesn't really, it's not really useful. I don't think to like re relitigate every, reason this didn't work succeed suffice to say that like there were a lot of things that could have given it a better chance but i also couldn't in, in, in good conscience tell you that it would have succeeded even if everything was done perfectly maybe it just wasn't yeah. a right fit yeah because it did actually seem like not a great fit right like I, I you know the way i used to describe it to people when i had this conversation with them particularly at the onset of the stuff was that i was worried right like I, on one hand i was really happy the Wizards was willing to place that big bet on the esports thing, right? I mean, they really did it, right? They pushed hard. They put the money where their mouth was. They did the big prize pools, the big productions, all that stuff. And I thought I was really, I mean, I thought that was fantastic. There's a lot of companies that are just, they're just, they're never even going to take a shot, you know? And they knew they had something good on their hands with Arena and they, they took their shot. Um, but yeah, it felt like a combination of things, particularly though, just that, you know, magic's high barrier to entry just doesn't, it just means that it's just not a game that you can just stop by, right? You can't just pop by and be like, what's going on in magic, right? Like if you don't know the cards, you're not going to be able to watch this and enjoy it very much. 
Yeah. And that's just a fact, right? Where if you're playing these decks, then you can actually get into it. The commentators do their job. They can translate a lot of that, even if you're not actively playing the decks that the players in the feature match are playing. But still, you got to know what's going on to a point. And if you don't, it's just too inaccessible. To me, Magic trades off um, that sort of ease of watching for depth, right? Like the players that are into it are really into it, right? And and that's valuable, right? I, You know, I think that there's a, a good analogy that I have here is on YouTube, right? That a lot of people just look at how many views a video gets, right? And they kind of uh, will judge a video by how many views it has. But I can tell you that Google doesn't, the, the company that owns YouTube, they don't view it that way at all. They don't give a crap how many views the video has. What they want to know is how long are people watching your video for? Like literally, how many minutes are people watching your video for? Because that, because their bottom line is how many ads can we serve to people? And the longer they watch your video, the more ads they can serve to them. So they, they, and you can look this up if you have a YouTube channel as well. How long are people retaining? How, what's your viewer retention? What's your average number of minutes out of the total of this video that people are, are viewing for? Right. And I think that magic as an esport or a thing like that, you know, people watch for longer, they care more, but it doesn't necessarily open you up to the, to the huge viewer counts, if you will. So at any rate, uh, there are more unknowns than knowns at this point about the future of this stuff. And when we do know more, which probably won't be for, I don't know, a year or 10 months or something like that, we might be able to revisit because I did want to talk about one thing, um, sort of as we start to dip back over into, uh, the, the bulk of the show here. Um, what does this mean for the future of high level limited? And it's kind of interesting because you think this might be bad. I think this is actually good <laughs> because we weren't getting it anyway. Right. <laughs> yeah, like, we, we can't, we can't have fewer high level. Right, limited events. <laughs> right. And so in my mind, you know, I, a good example is this since I've been doing coverage and I am aware that these events happened before, uh, actually kind of just before I started doing coverage, but since I've been doing coverage, um, at the pro tour level, for example, there's been no limited only events. Okay. They all had a constructed component, but if you go to the GP level, so the open level, the one where anybody can show up and play, you don't have to qualify. I've covered a ton of sealed GPs, right? And there's a ton more that I, that I didn't even get to cover. And so if they're going to kind of push things towards the broader base away from the absolute peaks and stop trying to optimize for viewership, because it is a fact that more people watch when it's constructed than when it's limited, but more people play in limited GP than in a constructed GP, at least traditionally speaking, um, then we could see actually more limited tournaments as a result of this. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that like the arena open is actually a, a hopeful sign. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're going to get to that, but the arena started crashing for people because so many people wanted to play in it. At least yeah. that seems to be the most likely scenario. Pretty I don't sure know we exactly broke the servers. Happened. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that this does open the door for like, if you're trying to make it accessible to the masses, yeah. Why would you not do limited limited more accessible and constructed by so much? So I, I am really hopeful that this 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 can see the return of of some sweet limited tournaments. Yeah, so we'll keep an eye on that as well because this could mean more of them, and it could also mean different versions of them um, coming up because limited tournaments are very very popular with competitive players who you know w when you're not having to broadcast it. So with that, Luis, why don't we why don't we talk about the arena open and some good news, um some some happy stuff. Uh because you <laughs> and I both had a heck of a weekend uh last weekend during the arena open. Yeah, I mean uh I, between me, you and BK, all the resources, we walked over the cool six grand in winnings. That, uh, <laughs> I mean, how incredible <laughs> is that? Yeah, I mean, I, I just want to know how much the Lord's Limited one, but uh, <laughs> oh, jeez, jeez, <laughs> such I, a I, I honestly can't take too much credit. Um, so it took me three runs to make day two. I lost the first one at six three, the second one at five three, but I got there on the third one. Okay, uh, and my day two deck was no exaggeration, the best seal deck I've ever had in a tournament. I've tried to explain this to people. I said, Luis said it's the best sealed he's had. And they're, and, and they were like, Oh wow. And I'm like, no, 
Like, Luis isn't one to say that unless it's actually true. <laughs> like, he's not being hyperbolic. He's played hundreds and hundreds of sealed tournaments, and this is the goat. This is the one. Your deck was obscene. You sent me a picture of it in the morning, and I'm like, what? How is this possible? I, I sent it to, to Ben S. and Pat Cox. I'm like, I'm 3-0, but I'm going to go 7-0 with this. This deck is just, just the dumbest thing I've ever had. So the deck had – and this is – the highlight was – Two mascot exhibitions, which is the best card to open and sealed in the format. Seven mana mythic rare lesson, make a four four, a three two, and a two one flying. And it two of them, which first of all, that's just excessive. Like the first <laughs> one captures a solid eighty percent of the value, but having the second one was what put the deck over the top. But because in addition to that, I had two field trips and a cultivate, and field trip is just the grossest because it accelerates you and then finds the mascot exhibition. The first game I played with the deck. I went turn three field trip, turn four field trip, both getting mascot exhibitions. <laughs> my, opponent, my opponent said nice after the first one and then nice after the second one. And then I cast mascot exhibition on turn five and turn six. That is and like, just a joke. Oh my besides God. the two field trips, I also had a pop quiz, an arcane subtraction, a dream strix, the three, two flying rare that when it dies, you learn. <laughs> uh, and so I had eight learn cards in total. So, Every single game I played, I cast on a mascot exhibition, and I would, the vast majority I cast two. In fact, the main reason I wouldn't cast the second is my opponent would scoop because I cast the first and they knew I had the second one in hand. That's incredible. We're not done yet, though. I also had Archmage Emeritus, Tempted by the Auric, and Blue Sun Zenith. So I had <laughs> four total awesome blue rares. And in particular, Dream Strix and Tempted by the Auric are very good tempo plays, which is perfect when you have two mascot exhibitions. You know, if we're nitpicking, the Archmage and the Blue Sun Zenith weren't the perfect rares to combine with the mascot exhibition because <laughs> I already kind of had the late game locked up. But I, I feel for one of my opponents who had a great Mardu deck and they ground through two mascot exhibitions. Like, no jokes. Wow! Like, they, they had like... They humiliated one of them. They had like igneous inspiration. They killed my stuff. Rise of Exodus. And they're probably feeling pretty good. They, they they got the board clear. Two mascot exhibitions down. At the end of their turn, I cast Blue Sun Zenith for six. And then just <laughs> buried them in, in cards. Blue Sun Zenith for, si for six. Trigger my <laughs> Archmage Emeritus. You know, like, it's like, oh, come on. I play. I had a biblioplex assist, and I had three, but I only played one. And and there were some games where I had access to three mascot exhibitions oh as a result. God. Like I divide by zero. That was another one of my learn cards. And then wow. I also had like a Quandrix cultivator. So like, and you know, just in case that I was in danger of losing the early game, I had two needle thorn drakes and a scurried colony. So I also had one campus. I would have liked to have two campuses. That oh would have been God, perfect. But God, please. <laughs> I, you I you opened two more mascot exhibitions than I have in the format. <laughs> Draft and sealed it, all my practice. Zero. Yeah. It, <laughs> let, let's just say playing the highest stakes Strixhaven sealed I'll ever play because the arena open is the best Strixhaven place to, to – or the, the highest stakes Strixhaven tournament available. It was the, it was the perfect time to open the sealed deck. And uh, yeah, I just – I, I I did lose one game to Mizzix Mastery plus a top deck Igneous Inspiration, like, you know, in his long, close game where they did burn me out with like nine points of burn over the course of a couple turns. But I didn't lose any other games. And uh, like you literally didn't lose any other games. Yeah, yeah. Not not matches, yeah. games. I lost yeah. one game. I went 14 1 in games. Uh, and <laughs> I didn't lose any matches. Like, it, the deck was just gross. I, I felt, I, I legitimately felt bad for my opponents because it's like you just had the misfortune to get paired against a unbeatable sealed deck or about as close as you can get. I had the early game covered. I had the long game covered and every single game I cast a turn five or six mascot exhibition basically. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I was trying to explain this to somebody and I, I know it's tempting to look at a pool like that at first blush and be like, Oh, you know, Luis got super lucky. He had these two bombs in his deck. Right. But it really is worth noting that mascot exhibition in a shell like that is not, like any other bomb, right? It's effectively in your hand every game. That is such a different thing than if you would open, say, two great mythic dragons or something like that, that sometimes you don't actually draw. I mean, you, it would be statistically nearly impossible for you to end up with a game that plays out in any reasonable way that you don't end up with one of those in your hand, right? If you have eight learn spells, you know, 
what are the chances, let's say, by turn five of having not drawn one? Well, we could hypergeometric it, but I'm going to tell you it's in the 90s, right? Like you are – if the game goes any reasonable length, you, you know, you're probably nearly 100% to have drawn a learn spell of some sort. So we are talking about a completely different level. You know, I know people I, – I remember people had remembered – um Way back when you had those GPs where you opened the pack rat and the Mizium orders, right? And they're, you know, hey, is that, is that kind of like this? No, <laughs> that is not like this. That is not even close to this. That's why Luis can say, this is the best sealed pool I've ever opened, even though he had those things at GPs. This is a completely different beast that has nothing to do with that when you have access to those cards getting into your hand Every single game. I mean, because the truth is mascot exhibition isn't even as good as some of the best bombs that you've opened over the course of your career as an individual card. But when it goes into your hand every single game, well, it's unbeatable as, as yeah, you it, proved. It, the, the, yeah. The reason mascot exhibition is just so un unbelievable is that it always is there. I Again, eight learn cards. I just never – I just never didn't have access to it and – that that's why it, it's such a brutally devastating card to play yeah. against. So yeah, I was pretty happy about that. I'm not gonna lie. It was a it was a nice little pick me up to to to, to easily cruise to 2K. I, my only regret is like I wasn't gonna stream it because I was just kind of hanging out on Sunday, you know, and like you know just kind of taking it easy. I kind of wish I had. Like I do I do have some regrets uh -huh. that it it would because I wouldn't have even needed a delay. They could they'll see the mascot exhibition coming anyways. So. Yeah. <laughs> would would you consider just recording those? I thought about it, but at that point, I would almost rather stream it. I don't know. I kind of wish yeah. I had. I just kind of fired it off and played it. Uh, I, I included – I tweeted out the pool or the, the, the deck. Though it's funny. People actually looked up the pool because uh, you can find it on 17 lands. I, I do uh, have 17 lands enabled on, on when, I, when I play Arena most of the time. Mm -hmm. And um, I also had a Day of Judgment and Shadrix, the black-white Elder Dragon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so – I could have made – my first draft was like, oh, what if I play blue-white because I had like two Rise of Exodus and stuff too. So I I believe I had a pretty good shot at going 7-1 seven, like seven, one or, with Silver Quill or, or blue-white <laughs> if I wanted to. But I didn't really need to. The blue-green deck was actually better. Yeah. I mean just the two field trips, right? Yeah. That card alone. So yeah. th this is going to – I'm going to remember this one. BK is already tired of hearing about it. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not. I, I love it. I think this stuff's oh, great. It's just good stuff. Yeah. What about you? you? You had a pretty wild deck yourself. It, it looked like a really sweet build. It was an extremely difficult build. Yeah. I, I opened up my pool and I felt elated and really nervous because I was like, wow, this is one of those builds where there are so many different flexible possibilities here because I opened to cultivate. <laughs> and, you know, that's the type of card that can enable really kind of whatever you want to do. And then, so then the next thing you look at is like, what's my removal? What's my bombs? What's my, my card advantage? You know, what are kind of the important sealed staples that I need to have? And as it turns out, I had good options on all of those, except for bombs. I, I did not have, you know, the, the hammer, right? I, and none of my cards were like, I've played this and now you can't win. The closest I had to what I would consider a bomb, and I, and I do consider this card a bomb, but in a different way, is Gnarled Professor. That's the 2GG 5-4 that you learn. That card is obscenely powerful, just like mana to power and toughness to card advantage. It's gross, right? But it's not the same thing as when you play like Velomachus or something and you're just like, oh, crap, I'm dying in like two turns and they're getting card advantage now and, you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, you don't need that stuff to win it sealed, especially in a format like this one where if you can cast kind of any spells you want, you can do it. So the, the real issues that I came up with were I had multiple builds with a full suite of very good removal and decent expensive stuff, but very light on creatures. And the sort of core conceit of the deck was I had the two cultivate, and then I had a really good suite of black removal. I had Lash of Malice, Eliminate, Flunk, Umbral Juke, and two copies of Rise of Extus and a Putrefy. Okay. So if I'm going to play Cultivate, I am going to play Eliminate. I'm going to play Flunk. I'm probably going to play Lash if I'm going to play those. And then, yeah, Umbral Juke has been pretty strong and I'm definitely playing both Rise of Extus. Okay. So there's that. So then I kind of built like a Wither Bloom thing with a little bit of splashes here or there or whatever. It wasn't that powerful. 
So then I started to say, okay, well, what if I can get blue in here? Well, as it turned out, not that great either, but some key stuff that I could get into the deck. I started playing around with red. Red was actually pretty strong. I had two copies of um, of a Heated Debate. I had a Rutha and I had an Electrolyze. I also had two Elemental Masterpiece, which I really like in Sealed. So I started to play with that. But when your deck has Lash of Malice, Eliminate, Flunk, Umbral Juke, Putrefy, <laughs> right? Two Rise of Exus and you're like Heated Debate, Heated Debate and electrolyze, it's too much. Like, you just don't have anything that can actually win the game at some point. Sure, you can kill all their stuff. But, I mean, they're less than learning, too, and people are playing their best stuff. So what I ended up doing was building a very strange deck that was black-green at its core. That got me the Cultivates, the Removal, the Putrefy, two Witherbloom Apprentice, which, when you're casting a bunch of spells, actually adds up pretty good. And then I also got, as I mentioned, the Gnarled Professor, a random Mage Hunter, and then a Leyline Invocation for the top. Okay, and then I mentioned the Rise of Exus, so that's good. And I ended up splashing for both red and blue. I put both Elemental Masterpiece in the deck, so I got two of those. I put a Baryan Books in the deck. I put a Quandrix Cultivator in the list, which I really like. I put a Pop Quiz in. Out of all the cards I could have splashed, I splashed for Pop Quiz. And then I ended up also running Kazmina and Enigma Sage, which is the one blue green planeswalker. Um, rounding out the deck was a campus guide. And it felt really weird because I left a bunch of premium stuff in the board, basically. And it was like, oh, and I also played a retriever Phoenix. I, I, I forgot to mention that. This was very strange, right? Like the, but it actually made sense. I made sure to get enough removal to kill all my opponent's stuff, enough late game through cards like Elemental Masterpiece and Rise of Exodus to be able to get the job done. And then I needed like a critical number of learn cards. Retriever Phoenix was like my best learn option. So that's why I splashed it and not like heated debate or, or an electrolyze. If I could make one change, I would cut Casmina and I would actually play the electrolyze in the main deck. I found myself bringing it in pretty often. Uh, obviously, it's an amazing magic card, but it is a double splash um, for the deck. And then the last thing that was noteworthy for the deck was that it had a well-rounded lesson package. It didn't have any of the bomb stuff, but it had all the good common. So I could make a 4-4. I could make two pests. I could make a 3-2. I could kill. I could exile a thing and have them draw a card. Um, I could uh, critically go get a land. <laughs> and then I, I could preordain. I just basically had one each of all the common lessons that you would want. And I had a fractal summoning as well to spend all that mana on. This gave me immense flexibility during the course of the game and uh, of the games. And the only match I lost was to an absolutely absurd deck. <laughs> my, my opponent in the first game, we, we exchanged resources for a long time. And uh, then they played Velomachus. And, and missed. So I'm like, okay. And I didn't have anything left in my hand. And I whiffed and passed the turn. Then they played Shadrix the next turn. And I'm like, are you kidding me? So I got hit pretty hard there and they hit some learn card or whatever. And then I m missed again and I passed the turn back to them. And then they played Blot Out the Sky for the full amount. I'm like, what the? This is triple, triple mythic rares on back to back to back turns. So I lost that game. And then incredibly in game two, my opponent did that exact same sequence again. And I won the game. Like, it was really one of my, like, I'm sitting here in my office, and when I won, the, I, I needed something, right? Last turn, scry, um, and I hit a lesson card into a removal spell, and I, and I, and I won for Xaxes that turn with my opponent having resolved all three of those cards. And I was like, I mean, I was, I was like, yes, you know, even though I didn't even win the match off of that, I just won the game. And then, uh, and then in game three, my opponent <laughs> didn't play any of those three mythics and just manhandled me. <laughs> they just kicked the crap out of me with like just good value cards, like the four, two fire that gets a thing back and all that. And that was the, the, I was at four wins at that point. So I ended up being four one. And then I won the next one to put me in the driver's seat. I won that one to get to the 1000. And then I had my, my match. And I have to tell you, Luis, um, you know, you've had a lot of experience winning and being in the high level stuff. And I haven't. And so 
but I know better. I've seen it. I've been around it. I've talked to people, you know, so I definitely, when I won the thousand, I was thrilled, right? That was awesome. And I'll tell you, Luis, I had to really walk myself off the just happy to be here mode. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's a power, it's a powerful, alluring feeling. You gotta, yeah. you, you gotta, you gotta not, not run into it though. That's right. Yeah. Whatever. I have to mulligan, but you know, I got the thousand. I'm good. You know, I was excited to talk about it on here, you know, and I'm like, no, no, uh-uh. yeah. I'm like, I am dialing in cause this is going to be tough. And uh, I want, I, you know, it's a match for a thousand bucks. You don't get to play that very often. And, uh, it was really interesting cause in the last round I ended up playing, a player playing Obzon, but their deck was almost the same as mine as far as its general makeup. It was mainly removal based with two Rise of Exus at the top, a lot of options to get on the learn. And so we exchanged a lot of resources and then they went like rise into thing, into thing, and they killed me. And I'm like, okay, fight, fight, fight. So we had a very similar run out in game two, but at this time it was in my favor. I was the last one to cast a Rise of Exus and I won the game. And then we went to game three and it was really interesting. My opponent, so they're on the play and they go land, I twitch, go. Um, and I'm like, okay, I play my land, I say go. And they go swamp number two, attack you with I twitch. I'm like, okay, they're three color. And I mean a real three color deck here. They're playing humiliate, you know, cards, you know, all these gold cards, all that kind of stuff. Pass back to me. I play a land, I play Wither Boom Pledge Mate or Wither Boom Apprentice, pass turn back to them. They go swamp number three, don't attack, pass. And so now I have a decision to make because if I attack, they're going to block with their eye twitch. They're going to get environmental sciences and they're going to be able to get their mana going. If I don't, I'm not pressuring them and I'm going to give them – and because I'm going to play another creature this turn and I can actually start to hit them and try to capitalize on the stumble that they've had. Well, I decide that since their deck is full-on three-color – um, and they also have cards like, uh, cultivate or, you know, ways to search up other things. I'm not going to attack. So I take the line of, I'm, I'm not going to let them get environmental sciences. And instead of casting a creature this turn, I'm going to cast cultivate and I'm going to build up to an elemental masterpiece. And then at the right time, I will pick off their creature and try to like two turn them basically. Like they're going to get one turn where they can cast environmental sciences, do something, and then I'm going to, I'm going to try to finish them off after that. And that's exactly what happened. My plan worked. Um, they stumbled, they, they hit land drops, but it was basically all swamps. Um, uh, until I killed their eye twitch, they got it. They actually did have a really good turn that almost got them back in, but I had a backup removal spell to kill their blocker and I killed them and I, and I got the 2k and I was thrilled. So is this your biggest magic cash? I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Because I, I export a couple of GPs, but you don't get 2K for that. Nope. <laughs> um, no, 2K is a good path. Yeah, it really is. So this has to be by like a lot. So, and it felt great. It really did, man. I can see why you, you know, like, and, and, and you know, it's like $2,000 doesn't change your life, right? Like, it's not like, okay, now I can afford the, the car I've always wanted or whatever. But it's a lot of money to win yeah. sitting in your chair at home, you know, pl- playing limited. And it Clicking was a mascot real exhibition 14 times. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it was awesome. And, uh, I have to say, I felt like my build was, was either correct or close to correct, even though it was really tough. And I was really proud of my play too. This deck had infinite play to it. I mean, it was not auto autopilot deck. You know, there was decisions all the time about building up mana. Am I going long game? Do I need to kill that thing? All that kind of stuff. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was a real thrill, uh, to put a run in on that. And I can't wait for the next one now, obviously, because now I just assume I get to do this all the time. Right. Like, Oh yeah, no, definitely. Just, like what, what? I'll be disappointed if I only get the one K. Yeah. Yeah. No, they, the, the arena opens are awesome. I've, I've, I've been really happy, uh, playing in them and, and obviously like they've been, they've been a ton of fun, even like the money's part of it, obviously, but even without that, the, the whole concept is very, very cool. Yeah, it really is. And you know, we haven't heard any updates or anything, but, uh, looking forward to the, the hopeful day, um, when they figure out a way to make drafts work for this too, cause just getting to draft all day would be so awesome also cause it would involve multiple drafts and all that kind of stuff. That being said, Luis, this, I had a weird thing happen. I played a bunch of sealed leading up to, uh, leading up to practice 
And then when it was over, Sealed wasn't there anymore. And I'm like, oh, I get to go back to draft, which normally is exactly what I want to do. And I kind of didn't want to do it. It didn't feel as good when I clicked on the draft button and I kind of missed playing Sealed. Isn't that weird? Yeah. So it was actually interesting. Uh, I was talking with uh, with BK about this. Oh, by the way, he uh, he went 7-1 with his uh, – it was like a Mardu control deck, mostly black red. It was pretty cool, but mm. uh, it, it, wow, that's weird. Yeah, no, that that, that was a nice one. But uh, I actually found myself feeling the same way, where I'm like, wow, I kind of had more fun playing the sealed decks than I did in draft. I'm not just talking about the actual open. I'm talking about the practice leading up to it as well. I did a lot of seals, and we were wondering about that, and 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 uh, we we came up with a few reason. Uh, did we? As to, uh, yeah, yeah, we we did. As, as to why uh, why Strixhaven sealed, I think might actually have a legit. Con- it can be a legit contender for. I'm not going to say necessarily better than draft, but at least at least competitive with it, which for most sets is not the case. Like mm-hmm. call time sealed was, I think, much less fun than call time draft. Though call time sealed was all right. Strixhaven sealed got a couple things going on. One is that. Uh, the synergies in Strixhaven draft are not very strong. Mm-hmm. Like Witherbloom has some, you know, of the life gain stuff going. Silver Quill has a very light, like spell mastery style theme, but the like plus one plus one counters theme isn't really much of anything. Mm-hmm. And overall, like you're not drafting as much synergies as much as power. And lessons kind of do that too, where like lessons are powerful, but I wouldn't describe them as like intrinsically synergistic. You know, like you, no. lesson cards aren't really synergistic with other lesson cards that much. No. In fact, once you get too many, it's actually kind of bad because you run out of good lessons to get. Right. And in draft, that makes synergy drafting a little flat. But in sealed, it actually means you don't end up in a spot where you have to play a bunch of bad cards to justify playing a good card. You can just the cards tend to more stand on their own. And I think that that can be an upside for sealed. Mm-hmm. I feel like I've... I feel like many – it's weird because oh, oftentimes we look for these synergies to be very direct, right? If you control a certain number of blanks, get this. Whenever you do this, blank, right? But these have been a little looser. Like Magecraft, for example, yeah, it synergizes. Like you're like, I put these type of things in my deck so that I can trigger these things. But this actually feels like it happens more often in Sealed than in Draft for some reason, which is strange because it's almost always the reverse, Right. What else? Uh, the colorless lessons and hybrid cards uh, does means that in draft you're playing the same cards in so many of your decks. But actually in sealed, I think it really helps where it means you have so many different builds that are supported. Part of the reason you can make a Rakdos deck is that you get access to four of the five summonings. You can play you know, the, the black hybrid ones of which there's two and the red hybrid ones of which there's two. So whereas in – if you were to make like a lore hole deck, you have access to three summonings. And it, it just means that a greater variety of builds are open here. Like you have uh, the, these lessons, which not only does environmental sciences fix your mana, uh, you also just have all these colorless lessons, which open the doors for more things because your learn cards are in every color and give you access to those lessons. It used to be right mm. in Sealed. If I'm playing black, red, I have access to these cards. And if I'm playing blue, red, I have access to these cards. Well, now with Lessons, whether you play black, red, or blue, red, or white, green, you still have access to your Expanded Anatomy and Introduction to Annihilation. So you don't have to give those up. You do have to decide which colors have the best Lessons or the highest quantity or whatever. But you, you get to you don't have to give up your, your powerful cards. This is why Mascot Exhibition is the nuts. It's because right. no matter what deck you open, you're always going to get to play it. Mm-hmm. And uh, that having, I think, the Lessons and Hybrid cards really do help you – end up in a spot where you have a greater flexibility in building sealed decks. I remember, especially in like the older sets, you'd look at your 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 your, your pool, you'd be like, well, I only have two two-color combinations that get me even to like 21 playables. So I can just rule out eight of the 10 combinations already. I guess mm-hmm. I'll have to choose which one's better. Here, you can kind of build most two-color combinations, or not most, you'll have a lot of two-color combinations that you can successfully build. And that adds a lot of texture to it, I think. It's... Uh, it, it, it's it's a lot of fun being able to to have a lot of viable builds, and that's not even getting into like some of the builds like the one you you made where you just played four colors very deep, playing blue red gold cards alongside your black and green removal. Right. Do, do you think that 
like, cause I know that when I opened the pools, you know, one of the first things I checked was, was my lesson situation, particularly for environmental sciences. <laughs> Is there a world where we should just get spotted that card? Like it's so much more fun to build when you have that pressure <laughs> release valve. And it's so disappointing when you don't have one. Yeah. I, I, I think that it's still fun to have the times when you don't and the times when you do. And like, you know, obviously you always want it and it is a little disappointing when you don't have it, but that means that the, the times when you do have it, you at least appreciate it a little more. But yes, environmental <laughs> okay. sciences is a very big part of this. Uh, another thing is that the the removal is a little less interesting in draft because there is a lot of it if you really want access to it. And in your sealed decks, you, you have to be a little bit more conservative. Your sealed was an exception. Like you mm -hmm. don't usually get as much removal as the one you had in your sealed. Mm -hmm. But Mostly in draft, you can if you really want to, you can end up with ten removal spells. Whereas in sealed, you're probably working with like two to three good removal spells and like another two bad ones or or more conditional ones, mm -hmm. right? Your 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 silver cool deck will have like if you're lucky, two copies of Rise of Exodus and then a flunk, but then also like a Lash of Malice and then maybe an expel. You can't go too willy nilly. There's still some aspect of slow rolling removal which exists in, in Sealed, which kind of doesn't as much in Draft. In Sealed, you actually have to... Like, I remember um, watching one of BK's games where he played a Poet's Quill and he picked up an Introduction to Annihilation on, like, turn two. Mm. And the reason when I asked him, like, wow, how do you end up doing that? You know, instead of getting something, like, a little bit more cheap, like more something cheaper or like, or, like, a Spirit Summoning or something, he's like, well, my opponent's got Shadric Silver Quill and I just need a way to beat that card. Mm. And, like... That's one of the things you get in sealed a lot more often than in draft. First of all, because you're playing – well, when you're playing best two out of three versus best of one. But it, more even so that sealed has more bombs. So there's going to be more top end in general. And it's a little bit less tempo oriented. So you can afford to not get the three drop play and get the five drop removal because you, you know the game's going to come down in a lot of the cases to beating their good expensive play. Yeah. You know, I've also noticed that – even though there's some really powerful mythics in the set, this is one of the most popper sets we've had because of learn like, you know, cards like rise of Exodus and stuff like that just carry so much weight and sealed that that can be your bomb. That can be your finisher. And it's just a common, like you don't, you don't have to have Shadrix or Velomachus or something to, to actually win a game. And the fact that there's so much removal around means that there's very few cards. Like the only card that I really like when I when it comes down, I'm like, oh crap! Is the is the two and a white enchantment? Uh, sparring regiment. Yeah, that's the only one where I'm like, uh oh, you know, because it's hard to get off the battlefield because it's an enchantment, and if I'm a little behind, which I'm always a little behind because I'm spending all my <laughs> mana on stupid <laughs> environmental sciences or whatever, then you know you, it snowballs pretty hard, and it's really cheap, and it's also card parity. I mean, the card is really completely absurd, but but you know, like think about the big dragons. Like there's a cycle of these. Uh, uh, mythic dragons or whatever, right? I mean, those are all killable. Like, if you keep a mage yeah. hunter's onslaught, or as we, as you mentioned with NBK's, you know, intro to annihilation or rise of Exodus, if you keep those around and you manage your removal, you're going to have an answer for those, just like you would for any other huge fractal or you know, big whatever that your opponent comes up with. And it does make managing those more interesting as a result because you, you can answer everything. It's just a matter of did you properly manage your removal so that you still have it in your hand. I think another really good point is that the the second rare slot doesn't do as much for draft because you if you open a good rare, you take one of the good rares, right? You're not you, – you, you, having a second rare slot, you know, especially with like the mystical archives – there's, there's already a cap to how many exciting cards you can take out of a draft pack. It's one. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Sealed, now you get nine rares or so, and that that's a big deal. Imagine – you know how in most Sealed, like what you do first is look at your rares, right? That's the yeah. most exciting part. Yeah. Well, now you get more of them. And yeah. I think that that's pretty cool because the – it means that everyone – like, yes, it does open the door to getting even luckier now because you can now get seven playable rares on color right out of your nine instead of get playing like five out of your six or something. But everyone gets to play with slightly more rares and sealed, and it means everyone's got some good, exciting cards to, to kind of look out for. And I, I'm not saying I would want that to happen in every set, but I think it has worked well and it has made these seals feel pretty good where every sealed deck you play has some exciting cards in it. 
you're mm-hmm. always looking forward to playing some of your cards. And I think that that's a really cool experience. That's something that I think does go a long way in terms of making the games more interesting and the deck builds more interesting. I mean, it, it changed the dynamic. When I opened my pack on Arena, it, or my, my sealed pool, it shows you the six rares you get. And then after a <laughs> second, and then after a second, the little thing underneath says plus – Two more, three more, one more, five more, right? Yeah. And that's always like the best sweat is like, how many more am I getting? Like, I'll look at that before I actually look at what the rares are because I want to know, did I get a nine rare pool or did I get a seven rare pool? You know, <laughs> a friend, a friend of mine, Thomas, got 11. <laughs> it's like, what the hell? Yeah. And I think that, that that stuff is cool. I mean, there there is an element of like ice cream for dinner where you don't want to go overboard. Yeah. But this didn't feel overboard. And like you said, I think what it went a long way is that this is a popper set where Rise of Exodus can just go toe to toe. Like you, you know, I, I've had a game where I played a Velomachus attacked and hit a spell, and then they played Rise of Exodus, and it's like, how far behind are they? It's right. not actually unwinnably far behind. Right. Like, they're like they're, five damage behind, but they might get a better spell than what you hit off of your Velomachus, right? Like Yeah. And and, and I think that uh the the fact that the commons can be competitive with the rares really does help this. I would not want to see like, can you imagine a nine rare fate reforged, <laughs> uh, right. you know, Ugh. sealed, sealed format? Like that sounds a lot less interesting. Yeah. Also, so, you know, some of the rares are not at the rare power level that we would assume, right? Because they're the, what's it called? It's the mystical uh, archives. Right. When you get a mystical archive rare, it's not going to be always that broken. Like some of the rares in mystical archives are just fine. They're, they're not, yeah. they're not absurd cards. They're just whatever, you know? Right. So. I think that's good. And then I think that, uh, you know, going back to the original, like, or the, the earlier environmental sciences point is there's a lot of interesting kind of ways to fix and seal that's a little bit more dynamic than in draft because you have environmental sciences, which is a good, good part of it, where it's like, all right, wh- what learn cards do I have? Cram session, for example, is really good with environmental sciences because you can cast it off black or green mana. Mm. So you end up with this learn card which if you're playing a black green deck can always fix your second color. But even more interesting, you end up with a, you know, three, four, maybe even five color deck. And then you also have a, you know, letter of acceptance, which is a card I've played in multiple sealed decks because it taps for any color of mana. So the three drop artifact, plus it cycles itself later in the game and then campuses and then campus guide too. Like, yes, campus guide is not a good card, but sometimes you play it in your sealed deck. You had one in yours, I think, right? I did. That was the only and, card I didn't mention. Yeah. And and it, it was good. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure it did what it was supposed to do. It's not a card you're excited to draw, but like sometimes you cast it on turn two and got a missing color of mana. And, totally. and that's all it needs to do. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. The fixing, uh, especially with the dual lands and the, and, and, you know, I played an archway commons in my deck too. And, you know, th- those type of things adds a, another dimension. I, Luis, I got to say, Man, great stuff. You came up with some really cool talking points here on the sealed. And I don't know how you just keep coming up with this stuff. It's Yeah, no, this is, you know, sometimes you, you, you're just on fire. And, uh, and, and I think this is a really, a, a really comprehensive, in-depth, and, and really good look at why I think this sealed format has really kind of outperformed our expectations. And I, I, I want to say that I think we would feel this way even if we hadn't won two thousand dollars at the arena open. Yeah, obviously it's hard to remove that bias entirely, but to to give you a, a you know to to give you kind of maybe an example of why I think this way, just like you going back to draft, I was like, huh, is this as fun as opening another sealed? I don't know if this is. Yeah, I just got and used it, to it and I liked it, and yeah. Oh, I think actually here's another point. Uh, draft is more on rails in the sense that you know. Rare exceptions aside, I actually drafted Celestia on my last stream. Uh, oh my the, god, he, that deck was insane! <laughs> you should oh yeah, talk that about deck. that before we go. But yeah, yeah, that deck was something. But you, you you just draft one of the five colleges every time. Yeah, you know, and so, sometimes you splash a third color or whatever. But in sealed, you actually play all the color combinations or in and, and three color combinations you wouldn't normally play, and that adds more texture to it. So. I guess it's a combination of Strixhaven Draft being more constrained than normal and the sealed format having a lot of really cool things that don't appear in every sealed format that this is the closest I've ever had sealed and draft be. And I actually think I, at least right now, I kind of prefer to do sealed though. I bet if I was going to do like 10 more events, I would split them up between the two. And in fact, I actually just hit mythic. I've still been drafting because I, 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 I do want to see how, how far I can get. Oh, how, how high have you gotten? 
I think the highest I was was 35 or something. So you're the 35th best player in the world. Maybe right. it was 50. I don't, I don't remember. But it's not bad. It's not bad. Um, before we go to just talk about that, that Celestia deck. I was watching yeah. that stream and it was just absurd. I basically started pretty close to mono green after like the first pack. I had like two blue cards and they weren't that, that special. And then in pack two, I got a late study break and guiding voice. And it happened that my green cards that were good included Dragon's Guard Elite and two Quandrix Pledge Mages. And and I was like, huh, I already want to be an aggressive Magecraft deck with like pump spells and stuff. And Study Break and Guiding Boys are just the perfect cards for this. So I was like, why don't I try drafting Celestia? I ended up with four Quandrix Pledge Mages, two Guiding Voices, like two Study Breaks, Reflective Golem, a couple other <laughs> pump spells, two Expanded Anatomies, which I took really aggressively. Yeah. And I just steamrolled the draft. It was it was <laughs> absurd. He really did. You crushed. It was so funny because you – there were multiple times where you had your opponent at like 14 and you had like two creatures out and they're like, yeah, I'll attack with my flyer. And you're attacking and you're like, do I just win here? <laughs> it's just like every turn you were just asking, do I just win? And a lot of times the answer was, oh yeah, yeah, I do have it. There we go. And, and you, and you ended up winning the games and you did win with that deck too. Yeah. I went seven one. Uh, I think it was, was it seven? Yeah. I think it was seven one. It yeah. was. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, it had some really – capability of some really gross draws. It was a little creature light. I was playing like Stone Rise Spirit, the 1-2 flyer, because it's a good place to deposit plus one, plus one counters. But I also aggressively went after like Snakeskin Veil. I had one of those and yeah. like ways to protect my creatures because if I could just get a Dragon's Guard Elite or a Quandrix Pledge Mage out, the game didn't last very long after that. Yeah, and you know that Stone Rise Spirit did get you some wins too with its act. It's rather slow, but activated ability on your 7-7 seven, seven on the ground or whatever, it actually it actually added up. Anyway, you can you can still uh, draft outside the box, but I do agree with the broader point that you made before about uh, you know uh, when there's five color pairs in a set that's been um, highlighted, uh, it can feel a little bit on rails, and the and the seal doesn't quite feel that much. So probably just another reason why. Okay, let's call it a show there, Luis. Um, hopefully, this wasn't too much of a bummer <laughs> for people as we did get back to the to the fun stuff, but. You know, Luis and I um, are greatly affected, you know, by the things that have happened and they probably do affect you on some level. So we wanted to touch on them um, here on the show because they're what's on our mind today. Um, if you want to find us on social media, you can let us know what you think about these changes or, you know, say hi, whatever. I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. You can find everything related to the podcast at LRcast.com. I want to remind you the show is brought to you by Channel Fireball. If you like, um, if you like to buy product and open it up, you can try box breaks. It's kind of a cool way to do this. You uh, you buy basically a portion of a sealed product. They open it live on the stream and you get a random uh, part of it that you get to keep and other people get to keep, uh, keep their parts. And it's a fun sweat and a way that maybe you could get in on some sealed product that you maybe wouldn't want to buy like a whole box of, but say a sixth of a box or an eighth. And uh, that way, maybe it's a little more affordable for you to be able to get in and then you get the, you get the kind of fun sweat of watching them open it up live on the stream and seeing what you got. Um, you can check that out at channelfireball.com slash box breaks. And uh, again, if you do get anything, if you use the affiliate code LR, we do appreciate it. Um, that's it. That's going to do it for this one. We'll see you next week. So I, I think before we go, I, as as maybe the pro magic scene as we know it is drawing to a close, uh, I did want to shor- share some more just kind of random unconnected stories from from my time in it because uh, a lot of the memorable things in my life, of course, have happened because this is how I spent a lot of my my twenties. Right, it was it was mm-hmm. traveling to these and some of my thirties as well, uh, and playing in these tournaments. Uh, one one that that I remember was in. Uh, it, in Gothenburg in Sweden, we, there was a Grand Prix there, GP Gothenburg, and uh, we all stayed at the same hotel. It was a pretty nice hotel because it was just not – there weren't that many around Sweden. You know, Gothenburg's not a huge city. And, you know, this is back when you had to like go exchange money, which you don't really do as much. I don't know how much you have when I when you've traveled internationally. It feels like every place just accepts your credit card now and you, you kind of just do that, right? It's just not that big of a deal to like – like I remember going to the bank to, to change money before going on a trip, and that's just like not a thing I, I have done very often when I when I'm flying to other places. <laughs> but the hotel there would would exchange money for you as most hotels do, right? I don't know what happened or why, but you know I, I think it was Ben S went to go exchange three hundred dollars, and then we were walking by the, the down the street, and there's a money exchange place on the corner, 
And he looked at, he stopped and like looked at the thing and he's like, oh, that's weird. I'm like, we're like, what? He's like, I don't know why, but I think the hotel's exchange rate is off. He's like, let me go, let me go, let me go find out. And he goes in and basically if you change 300 US dollars uh, into, I think it's kroners, the Swedish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, currency, and then you went to the exchange place outside and changed it back, you'd end up up like 80 bucks. <laughs> what? They just got the exchange rate wrong, and I don't really know how. Maybe they like went, thought it was like euros or went the other way or or, or, or something. I don't know. So can you predict what happened next? <laughs> oh my God, did they just have a line? <laughs> Let's just say there was a lot of magic players who wanted to exchange money that day until the hotel was like, "Hey, sorry guys, we 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 ran out of uh, we ran out of uh, credit uh, today. You have to come back tomorrow." Oh and then my god! By tomorrow, they had they had fixed the exchange rate. They, they didn't say anything about it. They just it was just right. Wow. <laughs> but basically, magic players everybody's are taking game. their whole bankroll and just sifting it <laughs> through the. <laughs> So I will say that that folks were not like too outrageous. I think most people just went to go exchange money once and then it was just like, oh, that was neat. And then that was it. I don't think anyone besides, well, maybe a couple of people went back for a second and third bite at the <laughs> apple because there was also a max of 300. That was how much they could oh, exchange at okay. once. So, yeah. But yeah, that was that was definitely <laughs> – that was definitely something. And also wow. on the way to that – oh my god. On the way to that Grand Prix – you know, this also involves Ben S. Funnily enough, we're on an airplane, and he sits next to a magic player who's a kid at this point, who's like I think like fifteen or something or sixteen, mm-hmm. and they're talking. And Ben's like, "Oh, where are you going to stay when you get to Sweden?" And he's like, "Oh, I don't know." I is like, "Okay, well, do you have any money?" He's like, "No, uh, I, I I didn't bring any money." Like, "Okay, what like what are you going to do?" He's like. Yeah, I'm not actually sure yet. Like, uh, I don't, I don't really have a way to contact my parents, but I have a bunch of tarmogoyfs or whatever. <laughs> and, what? <laughs> and so Ben let this kid, uh, who, who, you know, he went on. Actually, I'm just gonna say it's just Ben Friedman. He went on to play at a lot of tournaments. You know mm. him, but he just. He just straight up got on an airplane with no plan, no money, no no way to exchange money, not a credit <laughs> card that worked. Happened to sit next to Ben and just crashed with Ben in the hotel there and was just with us while we tested. And like whatever, that was all fine. But like it was just wow. like, dude, what are you doing? But that I is, guess that's <laughs> – That is bravery, I guess I would say. <laughs> hey, look, it's a spirit of adventure. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that, that, that that was a, that was a fun trip. There, there was definitely some, some oh. shenanigans, and uh, I guess it all worked out in the end. 